Howdy, kids, and welcome to Conscious Embodiment, Astrology, and Dreams with Dr. Michael Lennox. I am your host of this podcast where we come to you each week and talk about the astrology of the week and dive a little bit into dreams and dream interpretation. And man, oh man, are we coming at you at a, at a juicy freaking moment, man. <laughs> I mean, you said December was <laughs> yeah. going to be wild, yeah. and we're mid-December, so yeah, I'm no, we, we expecting are... a lot of points to be made today. Yes, in fact, it's going to be it's going to be a little bit of longer astro podcast. Uh, we are sort of finishing up the year, and it's been a rock'em sock'em kind of two years, really. And you know, we're we're getting ready to cross over the threshold into into next year, which is going to be a very very different kind of year. So I'm, I'm going to be talking a lot about the wrapping up of this year in today's podcast and the sort of the energy of what, what we're coming out of a kind of two-year process. It's been a little brutal. The process isn't over, but it changes very dramatically once we get into next year. But we're in the big, crashing, crescendo-like finish of what was really ultimately two years of upheaval, change, and transformation unprecedented on the planet. Speaking of 2022, we will have a webinar about 2022. Yes, absolutely. Right? Like I do every year, this one is scheduled for January 2nd. I'll be doing it live on the 2nd. It's a Sunday. It'll be a two-hour experience live, but of course, the recording will be how I think most people will tap into this, and of course, it'll be available forever. And when are we announcing? Like, we're announcing that any minute, right? Are we, Zoe? What, when Today, are we? that's... Oh! Yeah, that's why it's on my mind. Today, we are starting the promo, and um, you can just head over to the website and sign up to join the live webinar or receive the recording. Awesome. I love that it's announcing today. Well, have at it, kids. Go and, and join me or either on January 2nd or shortly thereafter, and I will talk all about this interesting way that the next year is going to play out that's different energetically than the last couple of years. Uh, in fact, I'll say this live here, live with, on recording on the podcast. I'm interested in what is going to happen in this webinar because some of what I say is channeled wisdom that I have no idea what that will be in advance. And so I'm curious as to what the download is going to be when I right. get into that state. And I'm, you know, what I'm doing in preparation, of course, is all left brain work. I create the outline. But once we get into that live event, that's a pure channeled experience. And I don't know what I'm going to say, but join me on Sunday the 2nd and we'll find out together. So we do have a lot to talk about about this week and the week ahead, but let's just sort of acknowledge the fact that we had quite the weekend with the full moon in Gemini, Venus turning around, and so we are officially in her backward movement. So heart centers are in a process. We're still really reverberating from that Gemini full moon as this week gets kicked off. And so we are then also hitting the biggest triple transit of the year this week, the square between Saturn and Uranus that has been hitting all year long. That wraps up. And then at the end of the week, we've got Venus and Pluto coming together yet again, but now she's backward moving, and that changes the dynamic completely about the process that we are all in, you know, with regards to love and intimacy. So it is a big final sort of astrological week of the year, uh, energetically. Let's Break it down piece by piece. Winter solstice in the northern hemisphere hits Tuesday morning. So that's summer solstice for those of you down under. This is sort of an interesting marker moment, right? Where the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere are holding the 
opposites, right, where we have the shortest day in the north, while simultaneously it's the longest day in the south. Equinoxes have a kind of a symmetry about them that causes us to sort of reflect on them as balanced and harmonious moments. The days are of equal length to the nights in both hemispheres, no matter which equinox it is. It's sort of a gorgeous twice-yearly moment where we get to say, oh, we are whole, we are complete, we are balanced, we are one sort of spherical consciousness, and this is reflected in how our solar system relates to itself. What happens on the equinoxes, however, is in order to perceive the wholeness, the balance of the system, you have to understand the sort of binary, meaning it's the shortest day in the northern hemisphere while it's the longest day in the southern. What I'm talking about is the marker that these moments are will be different for someone in the southern hemisphere where they are expressing the most light of consciousness, whereas we in the North are in the least light. Mm -hmm. So one of the things, though, that's important to remember is, is that we are always seeking to recognize wholeness and balance and harmony and completeness and a chaotic and crazy world, right, where we have both randomness and chaos to contend with, and we seek to find a sense of balance amidst that chaos. I, of course, use astrology as the greatest, you know, contextualizing tool. That's why I share it out there. And the equinoxes and solstice moments, while they are not transit energy, they are not event generators, they are moments where we stop and say, ah, this is who we are. We are these creatures that in this moment of our sort of consciousness, we must, in the North, understand that there is darkness, there is shadow, there is hibernation, there is a time to rest, there is the time to go into the fallow. And then by doing so beautifully, we then get to explode in what is our springtime towards the longest day, the summer solstice, where we get to express the opposite end of that continuum. So it becomes a part of the celebrating the rhythms of our existence by virtue of honoring what the relationship is between the earth and the sun. And this relationship is what creates life itself. In fact, it is the equinoxes and solstices and the differing lengths of the day that actually allow our planet to be a planet of bounty. We have seasons, and seasonality is why existence and civilization works. And there's a time to reap, a time to sow, and in the North, since most of my followers are people in the North, this is a moment to honor the rest that comes before recharging again. It's kind of funny that um, one of the highlights of the season is a Christmas tree, which is where we take this dead tree... <laughs> <laughs> shove it in the corner of the living room and then pretend that it's fruited and abundant. Like we put all mm. these lights looking like fruits and little ornaments looking like harvestable, edible, like the tree is fruiting. Similarly, in the, in the Judeo sort of portion of this, Hanukkah, we have a festival of lighting lights that the light inside was so great, it lasted so long through divine intervention that we were not plunged into darkness. Mm. Right, so the solstice in the north, the winter solstice in the north, is that moment where we say, yet it looks like all is fading into dark. We recognize and respect that this must happen so we can rise up again in our next sort of iteration of what we call spring in the north. And then if you just add the consciousness that there's a whole half of the planet is experiencing the opposite mm -hmm. consideration of the longest day, the most light, now we have wholeness and completeness, but we have to look for it, just like sometimes we have to look for it in our lives. We sometimes feel out of balance. Is that true? No, it's a perceptual thing that we feel off balance. 
So we, we get bigger in our perceptions and say, though I feel out of balance, balance and harmony exists. And in the winter solstice moment in the Northern Hemisphere, that exists by virtue of the fact that down south, it's the longest day, not the shortest day. Put them together, and we have a gorgeous system that is always in harmony. Just to have a quick little review, 2020's capacity to take our world and have it die to self and be reborn, <laughs> as happened, was reflected in the astrology by virtue of the planet Pluto that represents death, change, and transformation, and the planet Saturn that represents karma, reckoning, hard lessons, and responsibility coming together at the same place in Capricorn, right at the beginning of January of 2020. Jupiter was in the mix, and while Jupiter is the planet of bounty uh, and abundance, Jupiter's presence was actually the energy that made it sort of global and, and big and more over the top than it might otherwise have been. So you've got change and reckoning. <laughs> I was joking at the end of 2019 that it was death and taxes <laughs> were <laughs> coming together to have an experience that we had of reckoning. No longer could we move through the world in the way that we were creating the world without a breakdown presenting itself. And here we are. Mm -hmm. What happened as that energy sort of went into the rearview mirror and 2020 was behind us, we stepped into 2021 where now Saturn, the reckoning portion of what happened last year, is now engaged in a conflict geometry, a square, with a different planet, with Uranus, the great awakener, the planet that, yes, wakes us up to higher levels of consciousness, but does so through, like, anything. <laughs> Hey, my joke in sessions is Uranus wants us to wake up, doesn't care how he does it. You wake up by winning the lottery. You wake up by losing your legs in a boating accident. Oh, uh -huh, yikes. <laughs> it's a joke, kids. But you understand the point of the joke is Uranus's capacity to wake us up is utter and doesn't care whether A, we're ready for it or not, or B, that how it's going to happen is going to be something we're going to like or enjoy or prefer. Now, some people will have received great bounty and benefit this year through these two planets in this conflict geometry because squares are not only the energy of how things break down, they're also the energy of how we build things up. Like if you think of a square as a, a brick, I can either throw the brick at you <laughs> In a, in a moment of great change and transformation that knocks you off balance and, and is hard. That's good language to describe Saturn and Uranus in a square all year. But it's not outside of the realm of possibility. I certainly experienced this personally in building my business, right? That I was able to face the obstacles that were th strewn at me and build something, raise something up because squares also do that. They're not comfortable, but they are positive geometry that helps us make new stuff or get somewhere specific. You know, one of the, one of the yummy languages that Stephanie Azaria, an astrologer, came up with around squares is she calls them stepping stones. So the idea is I, like I got to cross the river, difficult task, but I'm yeah. assisted because there are stepping stones along the way. Yay! Except... <laughs> They are unevenly placed. They're covered with water and moss, so they're slippery as all get out. And getting from stepping stone to stepping stone might be incredibly difficult, but it will get you to the other side. Mm -hmm. So in this case, the square that we've all been dealing with is about growth, wisdom, reckoning, coming with our A-game, operating in the world through the wisdom we've acquired by facing ourselves in the mirror. That's pure Saturn. Saturn just wants us to grow in wisdom. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't care how he does that either. You know, Saturn will you know, throw the obstacle in your path if it will help you learn and grow. 
So if you put these two powerhouses together in conflict energy... That sounds like a bull in a china shop. <laughs> Saturn and Uranus. You know what's you know, funny having about that, Having heard both though, of those descriptions. Well, it's a perfect description because Uranus is, in fact, in the sign of Taurus the bull. <laughs> <laughs> but he operates through lightning and sudden and unexpected. Now... This week, guys, I don't know. <laughs> he, well, and of course, this has been all year long. I mean, this is something that's building and peaking true, on the true, 23rd true. of December, but it also hit on June 14th. It also hit on um, February 17th, right? So you can go back to the middle of February and the middle of June and get a sense of your personal journey around learning, growing, reckoning on you know, the Saturn perspective and rising up to higher awareness on the Uranus end. In, in terms of the collective, I, I got to tell you, I thought the year would be much rougher in current events. Interesting. This makes me nervous for the future because I think that one of the reasons why it's been quieter than I anticipated is I think that there's, there's a lot of waiting going on. Yeah. I think I there are a that. lot of disenfranchised, angry people who aren't ready to rise up yet and bring conflict energy in a public way that might happen when some of the planets that are getting ready to change signs change signs in 23 24 and 25 i'm getting a little ahead of myself but it, still the internal process of 2021 included tremendous amount of growth reckoning and sudden unstable changes that are leading us across that river we want to cross but man those stepping stones have been, you know, vulnerable and, and created unexpected things you have to sort of fix and repair. Anytime Saturn's in the room, you've got breakdowns. Anytime Uranus is in the room, you've got unexpected things. So definitely glance back to mid-February and mid-June to have a consideration. Is anything changing now or feeling disrupted or in process or might be knocking you off balance that has a thread to earlier in the year that can help. Often cycles join up similar themed issues or consciousness. So it is in fact very possible, and in fact maybe even likely, that if you're in some kind of an unstable moment this week, you might look back to June and February and see, ha, huh, look at that. This has been actually brewing all year long. And that might give you some assistance with how to meet the challenges of this week if it is, in fact, energetically connecting to narratives that played out, you know, in February and in June. I'm imagining the question that comes sometimes from the client in a session after I lay out something like this is coming. It's like the first question everybody always asks is like, is this a good thing or a bad thing? And that's when I slap them <laughs> because <they're> <laughs> <laughs> he's like, I just told you. Right. Well, it's because we there's, don't no, there's just no such thing as good or bad. You know, it's like we judge. True. It's all things. We judge good or bad. Change right. is difficult. Change can be Listen, I'm no great, I, you know, I, I'm a stand for change and transformation, and yet I recognize when things change, I usually get angry and sad. So, you know, yeah. there's a lot of that coming up from change that's happening. There is no such thing as good or bad. And so if you're listening to this and you're in an experience that you are declaring is bad, I invite you to reframe that. And if this is the last sort of moment where the universe is going to say to you, and this is key, and this I'm going to talk a lot about in the forecast for 2020. The way astrology is going to be expressing itself next year is very, very different than 2020 and 2021. It's a year where there are very few outer and social planet transits in the way that 2020 and 2021 had outer and social planets transits that none of us have lived through before. And we go through two years of that kind of 
change that occurs when the planets are heating up their geometry to a year where there is no new geometry. We're just sort of floating ahead in the trajectory of what is behind us. Now, that Project that what is behind us is jai frickin' enormous. Mm -hmm. So, what happens next year for us as individuals will largely reflect how deeply we did our work this year. Ooh. Saturn likes to reward for a job well done. Now, don't listen to this and get behind the eight ball and say to yourself, oh, no, I missed the opportunity. Trust the work you've done. Hear my words and incorporate them into your experience as opposed to hearing my words and declaring you didn't do it right. You did it right. We're all doing it right. We're all doing our best. And we'll have a chance to hit the next lesson again if we didn't get it right last time it came up because that's the nature of Saturn as well. He will bring the lesson back. But it's a wonderful time to be in consideration of all you've learned in this changing world last year and this year so that you can have a sense of completion of the new you that is sort of being pushed out next year in a fashion that says, okay, we changed everything about how you live in your body and how you move about the world. Now start again. I so resonate with this. I love this. <laughs> oh, I'm glad. Actually, it's good, Zoe, that you're, as the sort of voice of the listener, having an experience of, I can work with this. Like, this does not sound like bad news. This sounds like interesting news. It sounds very interesting to me. Yeah. And, of course, the gloriousness of this coming just before the year ends is a marvelous sort of natural place where we assess. We self-assess as one year ends and we enter the next year and we create this idea of intentions for the year to come. The fact that this brutal two-year process of planetary movement ends at the last week in December, just as we are at solstice moment, where at least in the Northern Hemisphere, we are all in consideration of what we learn and know when we get really still and quiet and restful. And then we get to move out into the world next year and begin again. And yet another reason to join me on the forecast on January 2nd. How many times can we plug this before we're done? <laughs> <laughs> I had the most beautiful day on December 11th. That was the day that Pluto and Venus came together for their first conjunction, the first of three. She was in her retrograde shadow. So the things that came up on the 11th for all of us, not just me having my lovely day. I mean, I'm not sharing that with you to make you feel jealous. It's to understand that there's a variety of experiences of Venus and Pluto coming together. So I had an experience that day that I was with my lifelong loved ones coming together for a celebration of the year. There was Christmas carol singing and there were other events of that day that reminded me of how deeply my life is filled with love at a really emotional level. That's sort of what I would call the top of the, of the wheel of Venus and Pluto coming together. Now, of course, the bottom of the wheel is change and opening of the heart, shifting in the structure of how you give and receive love, where the presence of Pluto and his capacity for death-rebirth level of change could make this Venus retrograde very painful emotionally and include griefs and processes that ultimately heal our experience of giving and receiving of love, but in a much different energetic quality than my lovely December 11th. So I want to make sure we're acknowledging both sides of the wheel because on December 25th, Venus and Pluto are coming together again. So your experience on December 11th, give or take a day or two on either side of December 11th, 
returns, but in the form of process or deeper explorations of love, intimacy, your relationship to your finances. And it's likely that what might come up on the 25th, give or take a day or two on either side, will have something to do with what it felt like inside of your body around December 11th when the two of them got together the first time. In some ways, they've just been hanging out, hanging out, hanging out, hanging out, hanging out. Like I'm making a demarcation of December 11th and then December 25th as like different. But really, Venus just pulled into Pluto's sort of cul-de-sac and she's been sitting there all month. Mm -hmm. But there is a deepening of the process that will be revealed to us as the week ends. It's interesting to me that this deep, emotional, sort of private and individual process, because Venus is a personal planet, we feel it at the personal level, is happening two days after the big crescendo of Saturn and Uranus coming together by square. So it's like between the solstice, the square, and Venus and Pluto, it's quite a week. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, it's going to be quite a week. But I beg you, please, to, in whatever chaos and holiday movement and travel and trying to negotiate with family and, you know, all of the stuff that this time of year can rise up, that you are spending some time intimately with yourself, looking in the mirror saying, how am I giving and receiving love? What am I learning about that? And can I please have more courage to go even to more deep and vulnerable places in my psyche so that I can come out the other side of this Venus retrograde truly ready to give and receive more love? It's that time of year again. Starting today, you can register for Michael's annual year astrological webinar. If you're interested in the astrology of 2022, join Michael in his live webinar Sunday, January 2nd at 11 a.m. PST. For those of you who cannot make that time but would love to tune in, once you register, a recording will be sent to you right after the webinar ends, so you can't miss it. Head on over to michaellennox.com and click the button on the home page. All right, it's dream segment time. Every week, Dr. Michael will interpret dreams that are sent in via email or take a live caller. If you would like your dream interpreted on the podcast, you can go ahead and email us at dreams at michaellennox.com. Hopefully your dream will make it onto the show. This week, we have an email and dream from a listener named Linda. So Linda says, about a week ago, I dreamed I was standing in front of a bathroom mirror, contemplating cutting my hair and reminded myself not to be impulsive. There was a film on the mirror that was pulled away at the corner so I could see myself in the clear part. Last night, I dreamed I saw myself in the mirror again. In my dream, I was braiding my hair and felt I needed to go look in the mirror and get it right. I don't remember ever seeing myself in the mirror before. Thanks, Linda. Let me be clear about this. There's a bathroom mirror. She's contemplating cutting her hair. Don't be impulsive. And then she, is it that she can't see herself in the mirror because there's a film on it? Yeah, there's a film on the mirror, but a corner of it is like clean down. And so she can see herself in the corner that's peeking out from under the film. Oh, I like this. Okay. And then yeah. there's like another scene where she's now braiding her hair and wants to check it. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's the, her next night. It's two nights. Oh! Two different oh, nights. Oh! Same mirror. First night, don't cut your hair impulsively. Second hit night, I'm braiding Braid. my hair. Mm -hmm. I like this dream. There's something very sweet about it. Let's just break it down like symbol by symbol. First of all, the bathroom is the room where we are most private and, and sort of in our integrated sense of self, like to whatever mm. 
To whatever extent we are, in fact, feeling integrated as human beings, the bathroom is where that is the most true. It's, mm-hmm. first of all, it's the place where we do the most private thing there is in Western culture, which is taking a poop and taking a pee. Yeah. So <laughs> much shame associated around our bodily functions and our bodily smells. Mm-hmm. So the bathroom is where we get to close the door to others and be with our own sense of private individuality. So it's a really juicy room for a dream to take place in because it's the dreamer having an experience about themselves of selves that is very personal. And then, of course, the mirror is sacred. The mirror is, I see you, you see me. Like, the mirror is how we know who we are and check ourselves. So she's in front of the bathroom mirror, right? So she's having a dream about who am I and how do I want to meet the world? Mm-hmm. Hair is interesting because hair connects to attractiveness, expression, self-expression. Through the Judeo-Christian myth of Samson, we have in the zeitgeist a possibility of hair and strength. And certainly if you don't resonate with an Old Testament story, if you just add hair as powerful in the realm of personal attraction, then Cutting one's hair could be to limit that. Or certainly, personal self-expression, the contemplation of cutting the hair is to very suddenly and very dramatically alter how you're ready to relate to the world and how you're ready for the world to see you. Mm -hmm. So the mirror is like a practice of identity. I'm, I'm looking in this mirror to consider who I want to be out in the world, I'm going to change that. I don't like what I see. But then there's this intervening message. I love that little, don't be impulsive. (laughs) Right? That's what that scene is really all about for me, is that intervention. Right. That there's a recognition by the dreamer that whatever is being expressed in this moment is not about making the sudden change. And then you might go to the next scene and say, well, but I don't see myself clearly reflected here. So like the desire to cut the hair impulsively because there might not be a sense of this is who I want to be in the world. or This is my authentic self needs alteration. The idea that the, the mirror has a film on it, therefore rendering the dreamer unable of clearly seeing themselves except for a small portion, a small corner. This to me is about authenticity, Hmm. right? That I can't quite see clearly how I'm presenting myself, but if I bend down and look in the corner, then I can clearly see who I am. And make a different decision. That's right. So the psyche is saying, What you're believing about not being able to see yourself because of the filmy mirror is, I got to make a change, let's cut the hair. Mm -hmm. But the wisdom that's now present is saying, don't be impulsive, just recognize there's something, there's information here. I can't see myself clearly unless I bend down. That's Mm -hmm. a symbol of, I'm not authentic in the world because I'm so busy just trying to, you know, keep the appearance up or change things, you know, dramatically or something about the vision is not clear. And the dreamer's psyche is saying, wait a second. I love the idea that in the first dream, it's like, don't be impulsive. Something's about to happen that you don't want to (laughs) miss. Yeah. (laughs) And what is it? It's braiding the very hair that the dreamer might have cut off the night before. So it's like, oh, you mean I can be self-expressive in a new way without cutting off the old way? I can take what I have instead of what I covet. I can take what I have and express it in a new way. Braiding of the hair. I love the esteem the self-esteem that these two dreams are reflecting because Mm. it begins with a crisis. Things aren't the way I want to see them, but the ineffective, impulsive reaction to that crisis is averted because the deeper psyche rises up and says, 
be patient, change is coming, but it might be different than your impulse. And lo and behold, the next dream is like, oh, look at all the fun things I can do with my hair because I <laughs> didn't cut it off. And so this dreamer was pretty surprised about seeing a mirror in her dream. Like she mentioned that she's never seen that before. Hmm. Is the mirror anything other than, oh, I'm reflecting on myself? Well, yes and no, Zoe. Like it is no more than that. Right? A Got mirror it. is no more than we're reflecting self. It's a simple, tiny little idea. Right. And in dream world. Well, but in same. not only dream world, but honey, but like in the mirror world, it's like God is in the mirror. <gasps> oh, yeah. That's the power of mirror work. I do mirror work all mm -hmm. the time personally in my process. So you've been to my house. You know that there's a mirror on the landing to the stairway that leads to my office. Yeah. I'm in front of that mirror almost every day doing process work. It's how I can connect to my highest sense of self that is pure because I've cultivated the relationship of me in the mirror. But the, the idea that the, window, the eyes are the windows to the soul, and if you gaze into your own eyes in the mirror, you are looking at the eyes of God. Mm -hmm. The closest you'll come in this life. To see in God through your eyes is to look at your own. Mm. Most people can't look in the mirror, say I love you, and stay there for more than like a flinching second. Right. That's why the mirror work is so crucial and important. To be able to look at oneself and unflinchingly stay in that relationship. Yeah. Right? And so this dream is all about that. Even though that's not what the dreamer is expressing, the dreamer is talking about her hair, but it's still the same idea that our relationship with the mirror is our relationship with our God self. And do we see ourselves through the eyes of how God might see us, or do we see ourselves through the eyes of our trauma? Ooh, that is juicy. Yes, it is juicy. We see ourselves through the eyes of trauma, then cut that shit off. Yeah. It ain't the way I want to see it. Bad idea. Wait another day. Let a new idea rise up. And what's the new idea that the dreamer has is, I can do more with what I've got than I knew yesterday. Hmm. And the idea of, like, I've never seen mirrors in my dreams before, it's like, well, maybe that's true. Do you remember every fucking dream you've had since you were <laughs> born? There have been thousands and thousands of dreams. Maybe there was a mirror. So the issue, well, oh, not the issue, the thing that's being expressed there isn't that, oh, wow, it's the first time you've looked in the mirror in a dream. What's, I think, being expressed there is how profoundly important this dream is to the dreamer. Yeah. And it rises up with all sorts of extra little oomph, including, I've never seen a mirror in my dream before. It's like, well, that's unlikely, but it might be the first time you saw a mirror at a moment where you were in some deep reflection of, can I see myself clearly? Can I push down impulses that are ultimately destructive enough to let the more pure, beautiful impulse rise up later that requires mm. some patience and perhaps some willingness to be in some discomfort so that we can rise up and have the healing impulse that will often follow the destructive impulse that we successfully manage to not do. Thank you for listening to Conscious Embodiment, Astrology and Dreams with Dr. Michael Lennox. You can find us on Apple Music, the iHeartRadio app, and anywhere you find your favorite shows. Head on over to michaellennox.com for information on astrology readings, the daily Astro Alert subscription, upcoming classes, and to join the mailing list.